we now have the inaugural lecture or a keynote talk by professor suhas p sukhatmi yesterday evening late evening actually professor fatak called me up and said that he has to take care of the press meet and that will you please introduce professor sukhatmi just before his talk and he thought that it's a very easy thing for me to do but when i started looking at it turned out to be a very difficult thing so i put myself a quiz as professor sukhat me quite often did and learned something from those advertisement tricks that uh, people play that small write up it's a complete in some 10 words so i decided that look if i have to describe professor sukhatmi in as few words as possible which words will i use and i have reduced that list to the following teacher researcher experimenter administrator author learner mentor and friend i hope i am right many of you know that professor sukhatme was a teacher here joined us in 1965 as an assistant professor grew throughout his career at iit bombay and retired in 2000 as the director of iit bombay he was our director from 1995 to 2000 as a teacher he taught many courses heat transfer and solar energy being his forte but he has taught thermodynamics he has taught uh, i think instrumentation and control sometimes he has taught uh, design of heat exchange equipment and i am sure i have missed a few he was among the first teacher researchers at iit bombay uh, produced a number of uh, phd scholars many of them are or have been teachers and professors in their own right at many places all over the world worked both numerically but set up a very nice experimental heat transfer laboratory where experiments were done on combined free and force convection radiation experimental measurement of thermophysical properties uh, compact heat exchangers uh, enhanced surfaces for condensation and other application he has been an able administrator he was the one of the young heads of department in 1973 that of mechanical engineering later on became the deputy director and in 1995 took over our director's position but apart from this uh, during the first 50 years of iit he has been one of those people whose stamp has been seen on our academic processes curricular structure grading systems and many other academic cum administrative system his administrative abilities were used not only by iit bombay but after his retirement even by the department of atomic energy uh, he was the chairman of the atomic energy regulatory board from 2000 to 2005 and handled the uh, safety issues and many other safety administrative issues pertaining to nuclear power plants and other similar facilities he has also been an author i think his heat transfer book published in 1971 was perhaps the first indian book for undergraduate heat transfer studies particularly in mechanical engineering later he wrote a book on solar energy i think both these books are in their third or fourth edition what is not known is that he has also written a book on the brain drain and uh, of course he has 
been authored, he has authored many other uh, articles, uh, research papers and review reports. His uh, reports on the placement and location of alumni of IIT Bombay uh, where talk of the administrative circuit and academic circuit in the late 80s and mid 90s. I have been associated him with him first as a student and then as a colleague and I also know that he is a learner. Any new technique, any new scheme, any new research effort, he will spend time learn either on his own or with a few of us. But I think the most important characteristic of Professor Sukhatme is that he has been a superb mentor. Although he himself has been a teacher, researcher, experimental mentor, administrator, author and learner, he has been a mentor and he has mentored a few generation of young people and I am not an exception in becoming good teachers, researchers, experimenters, administrators, authors and learners. I think I, that is enough about Professor Sukhatme. I now request Professor Sukhatme to deliver his inaugural talk, <coughs> the title of which he himself has kept neat and simple doing research, Professor Sukhatme. Uh, good morning everybody. Uh, I have lectured all my life starting from 1965 on uh, subjects like heat transfer, uh, thermodynamics, uh, energy, solar energy, etc., etc. Uh, sometimes to class, uh, class sizes of 15, sometimes 20, sometimes 80, sometimes 100, sometimes even more. I have lectured in the distance mode also once in a while, but this is the first time that I am lecturing to such a large audience and such a large virtual audience because this studio where the recording is going on has a few people, but I know that or at least I hope, I think I am right, there are quite a few thousand all over the country watching this lecture. So, it, it does feel always strange in the distance mode to say well, Right in front there is hardly anybody, but really there are a whole lot of people watching you. Uh, let me first of all uh, say that you know it is very nice uh, that I received such a nice introduction from Professor Gaitonde and uh, it is very nice to be the opening lecturer in this uh, workshop. So, my uh, greetings to all of you, uh, my best wishes to all of you who are listening. Meri shubkam nae aapke liye aur mera namaskar sabke liye. I said at the beginning that this is a large virtual audience to which I am speaking. There is something more about this audience which I need to define and that is not only is it a large virtual audience, but it is a large specialized virtual audience. It is an audience consisting of people, uh, men and women who almost all of whom have bachelor's degrees in engineering or technology or science, most of whom I would say more than 90 percent probably are in that category. Quite a few have master's degrees in science, MSCs, MTECs or MEs. There are a few PhDs also sitting in the audience who are watching me and there are uh, also uh, I am told some postgraduate students in the audience. So, that is the kind of audience I am speaking to. It is a large virtual audience, but of a specialized kind in the teaching profession or wanting to be in the teaching profession or in the teaching profession and wanting to move up in the teaching profession. And that is why the topic of this workshop, the topic is an introduction to research methodologies, because quite a few of you would be hoping to do PhDs in the years to come. In many cases, uh, the PhD is uh, not something, uh, is, is a prerequisite for you to move up the ladder also. 
So, that is the audience to which I am speaking this morning. Now, one of the first things one does in any uh, such situation is to define the scope of what one is going to speak on. The title may be general, I have used the general title saying doing research, but really what I am going to speak about is doing research towards doing a PhD. I am going to restrict myself to that. That means, I am assuming that a whole lot of you who are listening to me want to do a PhD sometime in your career and therefore, research as done for a PhD, that is what I am trying to focus on. So, we uh, the, the first thing one always says in such a situation is, well, what does a PhD, what does it involve to do a PhD? The, the first thing is, one should define or at least from some regulations take a sentence saying, what do you expect from somebody doing a PhD? So, you know, the, I took this from the University of London regulations, I could take it from any university, most universities say the same thing in different ways. But it is a very important and a very concise sentence which describes what one wants to do for a PhD. A thesis for the PhD must form a distinctive contribution to the knowledge of the subject and afford evidence of originality shown by the discovery of new facts and or the evidence of independent critical power. This is a very carefully constructed sentence and it is really what defines what we look for in a good PhD or in a, in a PhD, not just a good PhD. Some element of originality which adds to the knowledge of the subject, some discovery of a new fact or the evidence of having interpreted what is already known in some independent and important critical manner. That is what we look for in a PhD. Now, this, this is what we look for. So, before I proceed further, let me say the following. I have already identified that many of you want to do a PhD, are interested in the methodology, the process of doing a PhD and it is also an important prerequisite for moving up, nothing like having a prerequisite to give that little bit of push to a person. So, the first and foremost thing to uh, which one wants to say about doing a PhD is, the research associated with it is not to be treated as an obstacle, that an obstacle which has to be overcome, rather the research that you are doing, you have to look upon it as a challenge, as a means to improving your professional skills, so that you can do your job better, whether your job you may be a lecturer, a reader, an assistant professor, a professor, whatever it is, you can do that job better as you go forward. That is the way to look upon doing a PhD. Do not take it up saying it is an obstacle, I have to somehow get around it. That way you are taking, making the first, shall I say, not making the right move towards doing a PhD well. So, one does not do a PhD and forget about the research one has done, rather one does the research for a PhD, so that that research has a positive influence on the way one handles one's duties later on in one's career. That is the way to look upon a PhD. It is a whole lot easier if you look upon the PhD as that is what your aim is, rather than as I said as an obstacle. Now, before I proceed further, let me, uh, uh, let me give the outline of my lecture. I am going to proceed as follows. I am going to first have the introduction, then I am going to talk about the research process or the research procedure for doing a PhD and that is really the main part of my lecture, that second topic. Then I am going to talk about the characteristics needed for a, from a person for doing research. I am going to talk about developing communication skills and I am going to talk briefly about the issue of plagiarism. And then I will conclude with some remarks to sum up what I have said during this lecture. That is the way I am going to proceed. Now, let, let me say at the beginning also one thing that I am touching on all these topics. What is to follow later are lectures which will deal with all these topics in much more detail. So, I am going to be touching on that, like the research process, how one does uh, literature searches, how one reads papers, 
uh, or later on when one does one's experimental or theoretical work, how one goes about doing it, how one plans one's research, how one plans experiments, how one writes a thesis, how one pre presents one's thesis. All these are topics for the which later lecturers are going to take up in much more detail. So, it is not that you know when I say this it is done, I am really going to touch on them for a few minutes each. So, you are going to get much more detail from all the experts who are to follow today, tomorrow and over the next few days that this workshop is conducted. So, now let us move on to the with the lecture and as I said uh, the outline I have just pointed out to you, I have just finished the introduction that is topic 1 and we move on to the main topic that is the research process for doing a PhD that is what we are moving on to doing. What I have done is, I have put the research process in terms of a number of steps and I am going to take time over each step to say what I mean by it, how one goes about it and so on. That is the way we are going to approach it. The process I am suggesting is for a typical problem in engineering or science. I want to say that at the beginning. It is not a process which one perhaps may adopt for uh, let us say a thesis in the humanities or in the arts, the, the process may be entirely different. But now I am talking to engineering college teachers who are teaching engineering or science and so therefore, the process that I am describing is specifically for such teachers. If they were to do a PhD, what is the kind of process that they would follow? So, it is typical, what I am saying is generally typical for what is for engineering and science. I also want to emphasize that there is nothing that is rigid about this process. It is a process that I feel is in general explains the way we proceed, but I cannot say that everyone has to follow exactly this and go in that order. It is an indicative process that is also important. I do not want somebody to say and say I attended that lecture and Professor Sukhatme said after step 3 is step 4 and I have to do step 4. That is not the idea. The idea is it is a kind of indicative process which moves forward. The other comment, the third comment I want to make about what is going to follow is, it is a process in which you have as a student, you are the student doing the PhD, as a student you have got to be putting feedback into that process all the time. As you are moving along, you are experiencing the process, you may want to put feedback and alter some of the decisions you have taken earlier. So, it is not a process saying step 1 complete, step 2 complete, it is a process in which you go forward and then at some point you may say well. I had said thought of doing this at step 2, maybe I need to reread that or rethink that. So, it is a process in which feedback plays an important role, that is also important. So, now let us take up the steps one by one and there are number of steps, I will go through each and talk a little about each of them. The first step is which I put down is identify a research problem broadly in a general area of interest this is what I have put down. Now, let us say you know since I am a teacher of heat transfer, fluid mechanics and subjects in energy, naturally most of the examples I will take will be from these areas, but it does not mean whether you are an electrical engineer or a mechanical engineer or a chemical engineer that you are going to do anything different. So, the examples I give are examples which relate to what I am concerned. So, what do I mean by this? Identify a general uh, problem broadly in the general area of interest. First of all the setting, what is it we are work, you, you are a person probably in the late 20s or 30s, you have done teaching for a few years, you who are in the audience listening to me, you want to do a PhD, that is the setting. Now, an important step in doing a PhD is to have a guide, a supervisor. If for instance, you are in an engineering college or an institute attached to some university, one possibility is that your guide or your supervisor would be one of the senior professors in your institute or your college or your university, that is one possibility. A second possibility is you may be deputed by your college to some other institute like an IIT or an NIT or the IISC or some other university. 
where there is somebody who will serve as your guide, some reasonably senior person who is who will serve as your guide or supervisor. Now, the choice of a guide is critical, there is no question about it, because the guide is not somebody who is going to be with you for 3 years and somebody who suggests the problem that you are going to work on and sort of you discuss the problem with him from time to time. The guide is your mentor also, the guide eventually we hope would be your friend also. I mean that is the way the relationship has to go as you go along. So, the choice of a guide is critical for doing a PhD thesis, there is no question about it. Uh, the, the guide can influence the selection of your PhD topic quite significantly. Now, just to give an example. Uh, and I am going to take my own example, just to give you an idea of what happened 50 years ago when I did a PhD. So, that you get an idea of how things, when I say identify a general problem broadly in a general area of interest, what I mean by that. My area of work then was heat transfer, that I, I was abroad and doing my, you know, done my master's degree. I had done uh, course work towards a master's degree in all the subjects in mechanical engineering. I had passed the qualifying examination, which was needed for doing a PhD and then I was ready to take my thesis work. And at that time, I was working on a research project, where I was uh, studying at MIT. So, one of the things one looks for is, one is working on a research project, perhaps that itself may develop into a thesis. So, the person who was the professor with whom I was working on that research project, I talked to him about that project and said, well, could this move on to being a PhD thesis. And uh, you, you know, we, we were uh, the person who was guiding me then for that project, not for my thesis said, it was a, uh, it was a possibility he said, but he told me straight away, he said, I am not going to be here for more than another year. He told me, my plans are, I am going to be leaving. So, uh, you need to look for somebody else who will guide you, because you need somebody who will be here at least, you know, uh, stay here with you. So, he suggested that I go to a senior professor in the department and the senior most that time was Professor Rosenau in heat transfer. And uh, so, he said go to him, you know, talk to him, say you have, uh, you know, he, uh, you want to do a PhD, I am sure he will have something good for you to do. Professor Rosenau was already a fairly big name in the United States when I was working there. He was, you know, as an advisor to the US Atomic Energy Commission, ran his own company, a professor at MIT in and out every day, that kind of thing, you know. So, I had an appointment with him through his secretary and I met him. He knew me a little, because I was already been a graduate student there doing my masters and he was the graduate student advisor. So, he knew me in that sense, but not closely, not from the point of view of guiding. So, I went in and I said, you know, this is the position. He said, yeah, yeah, I know you passed the qualifying and you are looking for this thing. Okay, he said, let us think it over, he said. So, what I am going to do, he said is, I am going to suggest two broad topics in heat transfer and they are going to be in condensation. He said. So, are you interested in this general area or not, you have to decide, but in condensation, he identified two broad areas saying one is on liquid metal condensation, one is on condensation of steam on clusters of tube, but high velocity steam and he said these are two broad topics, both of them are worth doing, both of them will be experimental that is he made clear, they will be both experimental, they will be both, they are worth doing. If you are interested, you come back to me and he gave one or two references in both of them. He said, these are one or two references which I have seen, I think there is worth, work worth doing in these. Now, you take your time, he said, take your time a week or two to decide which of these two interests you, then take your time to go further into he gave me some more background, which I need not uh, describe to you, but basically he identified two broad areas. So, I you know went back, studied both the papers he had given me, went to the library, spent a few days. I zeroed in on one of them, which was on liquid metal condensation, because I thought it was more topical, uh, experimentally more difficult, but certainly something more interesting. And uh, I said, well, I am going to work on this. He, he said, fine, go right ahead now. These are the th two or three most important papers you have already identified. Read them, come up with a research proposal on what you think needs to be done 
the basic problem he identified to me. He said the basic problem is the two, three papers which are the only papers so far written on condensation of liquid metal vapor indicate heat transfer coefficients which are much lower than the classical theory that is available to us. So, we have a discrepancy. Is the experimental work at fault? or does that theory not apply to liquid metals? That is the issue. He said. So, that is the problem. You have to work on it. So, he identified very clearly and today when I look back, the clarity with which he identified was I thought remarkable. That he could at that time say, here yeah, the PhD problem was doing, this is the issue which seems to be at hand. Go back, study those papers inside out, come up with a research plan how you are going to approach it. He said, do not worry about the funding. He was already, as I said, a fairly influential person. He said, we will get the money for funding for you for the next three years, once you know that you want to work on this. So, to me, if I look back today, 50 years down the line, if I uh, lo look back today, that to me was critical that a person of his uh, ability, of, I mean, he had of course guided many students by then, was able to give me a problem which really was a PhD problem. That is why I say the selection of a guide is critical, because that is the first step. If you have taken that incorrectly, take on, on a problem which really does not have much content in it, something on which others have worked and you are not really adding on much to the knowledge of that subject, then you are straight away making a turning down, shall I say a wrong street in, in the path that you want to proceed. You can keep on proceeding and then at some stage you will say, well, I should have come back all the way, I should have never gone on this path. So, that path is critical and therefore, the choice of the guide is critical in moving ahead towards doing a good PhD. That selection of that broad topic is important. Now, the other which if you look at the slide that I am displaying, step 2 is do background coursework to acquire breadth, review basic concepts and theories and make a comprehensive review of the literature. This is what you have to do now, one by one. Sometimes you may have the background coursework done already as part of your masters. Sometimes you may not. But I have always believed and most good PhD thesis are done if the person who is doing the work has a broad background of the subject that is really good. What I mean is again to come back to my subject like heat transfer, your thesis may be in convection or your thesis may be in conduction, but you should have a broad enough background to understand heat transfer in convection, conduction, radiation, mixed convection, all these areas. That means, you should have done an undergraduate or a postgraduate level subject, so that you understand all these parts. Then you may work in a narrow area on one of them. That broad background is essential towards doing a successful PhD and many people do not appreciate that. They think I join a place, somebody gives me a problem, from day one I start working on the problem. It does not work that way. Unless you have a broad enough base, you cannot hope to do narrow work in a particular area and do that work well. And this is something which needs to be appreciated. So, good coursework, a good background in the subjects that, in the subject that is broadly in which you are working is an essential part of doing a good PhD, which may be in a narrow area. And of course, you have to, the basic concepts you have to review and now comes the tricky part, the comprehensive review of the literature. Why is one doing that? Because now, you know the broad area which has been suggested, but now you have to zero in what specifically do I want to do and how am I going to approach the problem. So, you have to acquire all the literature that is in that field and then try to find out from that literature what is exactly that you want to do in order to narrow down to the problem that you want to take up. Now, in the old days, it was much harder to do literature surveys. You know, you went to a library and literally spent hours picking up heavy journals and you know, sitting with them and pouring through them. And at the end of it, you will say, all right, make some notes, Xerox a page or two. That was the amount we, of, shall I say, facilities we had. Today, with internet and online journals, the job of doing, uh, shall I say, literature search has become a whole lot easier. In fact, the difficulty is the other way. There is too much information on internet and you tend to stray. You see something and go in that direction, you see something and go in that direction, you see something and go in that direction 
at the end of the day you say well what have I read, you say well I have read 100 things, but nothing has really gone in, you understand. So, there is a also a problem with too much information. In the old days it was harder to get that information, you had to struggle for it and if journals were not there, you had to tell the library to get that journal from another library or that paper from another library and so forth. So, to some extent it has become easier, but to some extent now there is this danger that people stray too much they do not zero in because internet is a very, how shall I put it, addictive uh, type of thing. You read something and you go in one direction and go on, then by the time you spent an hour, I would say, well, this is not really what I came for, I came with some other intention. So, one has to be careful to use one's time well nowadays. But as I said, the availability of information is so much, uh, I mean, access to information is so much easier today that doing a good literature search becomes much, much easier than it was say 30 or 40 or 50 years ago. Having got the relevant literature, see whatever topic you choose finally, the number of relevant papers which directly impinge on what you plan to do are very small, even today's world. You will probably find 7 or 8 or 10 papers which directly impinge on what you plan to do. So and so has done this and found this, so and so has done this and found this, so and so has done this and found this and you say well. So and so, nobody has done this and found anything in this aspect, that is what is worth doing, that is how you proceed. You, you, you look at the overall picture saying, he has, so and so has done this, so and so has done this, in between where are the gaps that need filling or so and so has done this, got some data and the theory says something else. Well, that is a problem worth doing, this is how one zeroes in on a specific problem worth doing and it requires intense concentration, it is not trivial. You read some papers, lots of papers in a general way to acquire a feel, but finally the most relevant papers and there are very few of them have to be read to the last sentence, so that you can exactly say what you want to do. You have to reach that stage and only you can do that as a student. The guide can only help you along that path, you as the student have to really get to that point. And if you get to that point then you are ready to take step 3, because then you are ready to define the problem of your thesis, the research problem of your thesis precisely. And that is important, at some stage you have to put it precisely. You remember I said there is feedback, so it is not that this may remain the final problem precisely, but at, some, at that point when you are moving along, you need to say this is what I am going to do, because it is only when you have defined what you want to do, that you can start planning how you are going to go about it. With feedback you may change everything and a little modifications may take place. Now, depending on the nature of the problem of course, you may uh, have a hypothesis for it. Uh, again, let me take uh, just to say what I mean by uh, searching for a problem. You know, I have said you get 8, 10 papers, but just to give you an example, again a student of mine who worked with me in the 70s, did a PhD with me. Uh, when he came to me for a PhD, uh, you know, I said to him, it's a, I'll give, we'll look at this following problem, I said. Heat transfer in external flows is always of interest to engineers, that is flow over tubes. There's a whole lot of data, I said, on heat transfer in forced convection. There's a whole lot of data on heat transfer in free convection. In the 70s, there was very little work on heat transfer in what you call as mixed convection, that is where both forced and free convection are important, all right. So, I said, let us look at that and uh, the, pers the student who was working with me, he said, all right. So, we looked at literature in forced convection, we said, we will take only one tube, you have flow going past it, we know very well if you are a heat transfer engineer, Nusselt number is a function of Reynolds number and there is a whole lot of literature known on that. There is a boundary layer, the boundary layer separates at the back, there is a uh, what you call a wake and so on. Free convection, again a whole lot of data, Nusselt number depends on Grashof number, all right. And you have again a boundary layer and separation at the back, if it is a turbulent boundary layer. But in mixed convection, there is very little work and particularly very little analytical work on the boundary layer, when both Reynolds number and uh, Grashof number were important independent parameters. So, I said to him, this is worth looking at. And in fact, there were other people in the world also who had started to look at that problem, both experimentally and theoretically. So, that is how we zeroed in on the problem in the 70s, saying 
this is worth looking at. Let us look at the problem whether we can do some part analytically, some part experimentally and that is how the PhD thesis developed. So, uh, the, the formulation uh, was the of the problem, uh, the formulation of a hypothesis depends on defining that problem and in this case as I said, we took a regime which was a combination of the two. There was data on one side, data on the other side, when both are important that problem had not been studied and it is worth studying, it occurs in practice. So, it is worth obtaining information on that area. So, this is how research problems get defined and as I say, this is if I may say so, an intensely important part, getting the general problem and defining your problem precisely are important things. You have to keep asking yourself the question which I said at the beginning, when I said what constitutes a PhD, what did I say? I said does the projected work, is it going to form a distinctive contribution to new knowledge on the subject or is it going to be original work? That is what you have to keep asking when you define that problem. If you ask that question, do not or rather not forget that requirement, you will always zero in on what you exactly want to do and that is how one defines the problem precisely. Now, having done that, that is having defined the problem, you then move on to the next mode, where you formulate if there is a hypothesis at all a hypothesis and then you start planning the mode of execution of the problem, I mean whether it is experimental or theoretical. At this stage, many universities may not require it, many do, one delivers a seminar talk, writes a seminar report and delivers a seminar talk, because you have now reached a stage where you have identified a problem reasonably precisely, you would like to say this is what I want to do. And when you deliver the seminar talk, particularly with your supervisor present, some other professors present, some new ideas may come or some uh, shall I say some errors in your thinking may come out and somebody will say well you plan to do this, but uh, you know that is have you looked at this aspect, some new ideas usually come. So, it is useful to deliver a seminar talk, in fact in most institutes it is a requirement that you give some kind of seminar, so that you have done the literature survey, you have identified your problem and you can tell this is what I propose to now move forward with. So, delivering a seminar talk is a very shall I say important part and giving some indication of your plan of action is an important part of moving ahead. Now, I come to the next part that is the work could be experimental, the work could be theoretical or it could be both. By theoretical I mean it could be analytical or numerical, I mean both, I mean it is theoretical work whether you are using some software or you are using you know solving some equations analytically, it is theoretical work I call it. So, I am using that terminology. Uh, what do I mean by experimental work? Well, you have got to as an engineer or scientist, you have to build some setup or some setup exists, you have to modify that setup. And the important thing to ask at this stage always is, what are the parameters that I have are independent, which I am going to vary in my experiments and what are the parameters or the quantities that I am going to measure. And to what accuracy do I want to measure this? Unfortunately, many people do not ask these questions. They think that uh, if temperature is to be measured, put a thermocouple in there, it will measure something or some instrument will be used, a millivolt meter or some uh, instrument will be used. Later on when they start making the measurements, they find that the accuracy is only up to plus minus 5 degrees, but they really need an accuracy of plus minus 1 or plus minus 0.1 degrees centigrade. And then all the planning has to go all over again. So, you need a plan of action in, it, in which you say what are the parameters I am varying and what are the parameters I am going to measure, to what accuracy do I want to measure. These are very important questions if you want shall I say reasonably smooth sailing in the work that you plan to do. And of course, it helps once you have built this setup, it can take easily take a few months to do, uh, then to do some preliminary testing to see that it is working well. If you can uh, test it under certain standard condition, then see that it is giving good results that helps and so on. But the important part is number 9 step, that means collect data in a systematic manner by varying the independent parameters. Suppose velocity of flow is an independent parameter, you will vary the velocity from as low as possible to as high as possible and over each velocity in steps, 
measure the parameters that you are interested in or some such para, I mean, experiments have to be done. So, systematic variation of the independent parameters and gathering of data is what we call designing one's experiments to get data in a comprehensive fashion. If it is theoretical work or numerical work, you might you need to model the situation. Modeling the situation means uh, it is a three dimensional problem. You may want to model it and say look three dimensional it is too complicated, I will treat it as a two dimensional problem and solve it. Or it is even very complicated as a two dimensional problem and you will say well, I will simplify it and first treat it as a one dimensional problem and solve it. Get some idea of the result, then I will move on to a more complicated model. So, modeling means being able to decide what situation you want to study, what are the constraints, what are the boundary conditions, what are the initial conditions and so on. You need to put this down, then you need to solve your governing equations, maybe analytical or nowadays more often than not, you will be using some software which you may have to modify for or adapt for your particular problem and so on. Again number 9 step is the same as in experiments, you have to obtain results by systematically varying the independent parameters. Okay. And this takes months and months. Now, I am now talking saying if steps 1, 2, 3, 4 that is identifying your research problem took an year, then this step of setting your setup, taking data, taking the data systematically is another year or so because the overall plan of action for a PhD is rarely less than 3 years. It will be about 3 years that you take to finish your PhD. And then comes the last part, tabulating, analyzing, interpreting results, perhaps gathering some more data, checking your hypothesis if you have made something, drawing conclusions and of course, finally, writing the thesis and presenting the thesis, that these are the last parts of the thesis. Now, I will I'll come more towards writing of the thesis as a separate topic later. So, I, just now I do not want to talk about that, but this is the broad stepwise procedure that one is going through. And if you have this in front of you, you will proceed systematically. The chances that you will do a PhD successfully are much improved if you keep this process in front of you, keeping in mind always that feedback is an important part of doing a PhD. There is no such thing as saying this is it and this is the only way to proceed. Now, let me move on having given this indication and as, as I said at the beginning and I repeat there will be other speakers who are going to come back and talk about uh, these aspects. So, I am just giving going through a, in a re, uh, relatively fast fashion, there will be other speakers who will take these up one by one, doing the lit literature search, planning experiments, making measurements, writing of a thesis, presenting a thesis you know, and so on. All these topics are to be taken up during the next few days in more detail. But it is important that the overall picture be in front of you when you get all those detailed instructions. Now, I come to the next topic of the outline I gave you. So, some characteristics needed for doing research and uh, I have listed three. I could probably list more, but I picked three which I think are particularly important. You need a certain amount of intelligence of course, and I think most people in this audience whom I am talking to, they are engineers or they are science degree holders they will have that level of intelligence. That is never lacking I find in most people who come to you for a PhD. The intelligence is there, that is not the issue. But the two next motivation and perseverance are things on which some people tend to shall I say flounder as they go along. The motivation is not strong enough and if motivation is not strong enough over a long period of time like two years or three years or sometimes more, if the motivation shall I say drops, then things do not just move. So, it is important that be one be motivated because it is a long drawn out process. It is important that one persevere and one on one's own one does things. Nobody is going to tell you from day to day what to do in a PhD, that never happens. A PhD is a supervisor, you know if he is senior enough, he will meet you once in a month. If he is not so senior, he will meet you once in a week, but he is not going to meet you every hour and say what have you done or do this, do this. That is not PhD. PhD means you have to on your own have that perseverance and individual ability to move and many people do not have that. I have 
myself experienced it with one or two PhD students who left me eventually, did not do a PhD, simply because on their own they would not do anything. Every day they would expect that they would meet me and I would say something that you have done this, you have done this, now do this. So, that is now, that is not like teaching in a class, that is what we do, you know, every day take a lecture, give a problem, give a quiz, you do it and next, you know, that is not a PhD. A PhD is something in which finally you have to take over the problem yourself. And if that does not happen, then there is no progress and eventually then that, if that ability is not there to persevere, then things do not move and it is better probably not to move, uh, go ahead. So, it is important to be motivated, it is important to have perseverance because the PhD is not a six month or a one year or a one and a half year project, it is always a few years, two is a bare minimum. 3 is the usual quantum of time one needs, sometimes even 4. All right. So, I thought I should mention this because some people as I said sometimes do not stick with it. Now, I am going, going to come to two important parts, developing communication skills and uh, many people underrate the importance of this. To me, these have been the two most, uh, two very important parts of doing a PhD because they are important not only for doing a PhD, the ability to write and present is important not only for a PhD, but it is important for your career later on in life. You have to write reports, you have to write notes. So, to be able to write well and to write effectively, so that you communicate is an important skill, which should be picked up again not as an obstacle for doing a PhD, but as a learning process, which will be useful for you in your life. The same thing holds true for making a presentation how to make a presentation, particularly a scientific or technical presentation is something that is important. So, I will talk briefly about these things, for about the writing the thesis, I will talk about the, the structure of the contents and the style of writing and about making a presentation, I will talk about how one prepares for the presentation, how one organizes the talk, the use of visual aids like I am using for this lecture, uh, slides and how to deliver the talk. But more like more as I said details will come in the lectures that come later on in this week. Let me talk a little about the contents of the PhD thesis. A typical structure of a PhD thesis does not, if I take it chapter wise would be an introductory chapter, a literature review chapter at the end of which you define your problem. So, that is what you have done under steps 1, 2, 3 which I showed you earlier. And then comes the chapter which is or rather the middle chapters which, uh, which are concerned with uh, describing your setup, describing the experiments, putting down your results that you have got, I mean tabulating your results and so on. Okay. The plan, the procedures adopted or if it is theoretical modeling the situation, putting down the governing equations, the software used or the, uh, the uh, what you call the, uh, the uh, iterative procedures which might be used for getting results and so on. That is all, those are the middle chapters. Then come the chapters which give the results and the discussion of the results in which you present results either in graphs, figures, tables, whatever it is and discuss those results and reach certain conclusions. And then finally, of course, a summary of what you have done. So, that is a broad order of a thesis as we write it. Generally, it is the first part that is the literature review is something you may have written also when you gave the earlier seminar. So, it is not something that is new to you, but the later things have to be written. That is the, the design of your experiments, the description of your setup, the procedures, experimental procedures followed, the measurements made, the accuracy of the measurements, all the results that you have obtained and then a uh, what you call correlation of those results or the conclusions drawn from the results or discussion of those results. So, that is typically a structure. And of course, at the end one gives references, there are standard ways of giving references which one should follow. There may be some appendices in which some details are given. That is somebody is interested in a particular detail, one gives it in an appendix, it does not put into the main text. As far as style of writing is concerned, it is important that the text, that one uses simple language. Many people think using complicated language is good, it is not so. Write in simple phrases, it is the most effective way of communicating. When you speak, 
do not use long sentences, use short sentences. If you want to make an impact on somebody while speaking, repeat that sentence and say it a second time, that person will remember it. There are certain techniques like this, which one has to keep in mind while writing. Keep it simple and keep your language simple, keep the sentences short. And uh, I always remember my school teacher when we were studying English, whenever we had a long sentence, he would say, break it into two sentences. Why are you writing such an involved sentence with so many commas, semicolons and, full, and a full, one full stop after three lines? Break it into two if you have some idea. Always it is more effective in putting across you want to say. Similarly, when you write, should one use an active voice or a passive voice is an issue. Many people use the word I, I did this, I did that. Many people use a passive voice, the temperature was measured, or you know the passive way of presenting. Usually the passive way of presenting is the preferred way, not the active way. But I think in the, probably in the arts, in the humanities, perhaps even the active voice is sometimes uh, necessary in order to convey what one wants to say. But certainly in sciences and technology, it is a passive voice that we use more predominantly. Now, at the end you have to present and as I said, learning how to make an effective presentation is a very important part of the PhD, how to present your thesis. Uh, because as I said, presentations of scientific work or technical work you will do not only now for the thesis, but you would have to do also later on in your life if you want to move up the ladder. To be able to present effectively is important. Now, let me make two statements at the beginning, when it comes to making scientific or technical presentations. And many people again do not recognize the importance of these two statements. Statement one, which I want to make is, the ability to communicate effectively to an audience is rarely inherited. It is something you have to acquire through hard work. It does not come easily to anybody. So, many people say, you know, say, oh, he is a natural speaker. You know, that is all right for politicians and so on. You understand? They are natural speakers. You can give them 5 minutes, they will speak for 15 on the same thing. Technical presentations are different. If you want to speak effectively, you have to learn that skill the hard way by doing it. And there are no easy solutions. Today's lecture I am giving just now, if you are listening to it, I have rehearsed it at home this morning. Okay. I probably did not need to, I, I, I mean after all I have written the whole uh, what you call slides that went into it. But it is an important part because I need to time myself, I said well I have about an hour, so I need to time myself. So both yesterday evening and to this morning, I have done that so that I knew what I would be presenting, where to emphasize what now. So as I said, effective communication is something you have to acquire through hard work. It does not come easily to anybody. The second important thing about a technical presentation is, you can speak effectively only if you know what you are talking about. You cannot bluff your way through. If you do not know what you are talking about, no amount of good speaking can save you. You need to know the subject. So, you need to know that subject effectively having read on it before you can present it to an audience. There are four parts to really making a presentation. First, you prepare your presentation, then how to organize that talk, the use of visual aids that is slides or videos or whatever you use, and then while delivering the talk. These are four broad issues one needs to discuss. While preparing the talk, remember always you will be required to speak extempore. You should not be reading from something. You may have notes in front of you, like I have some notes in front of me, that is strictly for seeing that I do not miss a point. I mean broadly I know, but one must be willing to speak extempore to an audience when speaking in a, giving a technical or a scientific presentation. That is important. So, prepare your notes, but never read from them. An important prerequisite for preparing a presentation is, you should know your audience. You should know what that audience is composed of. And if it is particularly when it is homogeneous, you must try to address the issues of that homogeneous or the majority of that audience. Like today, at the beginning you will have noticed I identified the audience that is in front of me, the virtual audience that is in front of me. I am speaking to you. I know roughly what that audience is composed of. 
the persons, the men or the women who are in that audience. So, I am speaking keeping that in mind. So, it is important to know what is that audience to which one is speaking and tailor the lecture appropriately. It is also important to restrict yourself, because there are always limitations of time when one makes an oral presentation, to see that one sticks to the time and not goes on and on and times what one is going to cover in that one hour or one hour ten minutes. That is also rather important, because if one does not time once uh, the order in which one is going to proceed or how much time one is going to take, there is a danger of taking too much time at the initial part and then hurrying along at the end and that is not desirable. You need to proceed at a uniform pace, so that you cover everything at the same pace and not speed up at the end and just try to you know gobble up things and move fast, that will never do. So, these are important things when uh, you are preparing your presentation, to be able to speak extempore, to know the nature of your audience and to restrict yourself to certain key points of your work, so that you can time yourself and finish within that time. It could be 10 minutes in a conference, it could be 20 minutes and in a lecture it may be even 1 hour, but whatever it is you must be able to adhere to that time limit which is roughly set. You need to organize your talk and what do I mean by that? Organizing the talk means you need to have a beginning. The beginning of a talk is probably the most important part of a talk you give. That is when you the audience decides in their mind whether it is worth listening to this person or whether it is better to go to sleep during that next hour. That is important to understand. because so. If you know the audience, you take your time in presenting what is it that you are going to cover during that next period of 20 minutes or 40 minutes that you are going to speak. So, you orient the audience to the topic that you are going to cover and you show the outline of what you are going to cover through a slide like I showed. That is very important in every technical presentation to give an outline, because then the audience knows what is coming and sort of has a broad picture of what you are going to do. Then comes the main text, the main part of your speech, in which you say, what did you do, what did you find, what are your results, that is the main text. But the important part is at the beginning to tell what is the topic, why is it important, is, a, is extremely useful to tell that well, so that people develop some interest in what you are trying to say. And then of course, at the end there is a concluding part in which you say, what are your conclusions and it helps to sum up at the end, to say, this is what we have done during this one hour. So, that people get a picture at the end. Now, another aspect which is also important is uh, uh, the visual aids. I mean, what do you use? You use slides, a PowerPoint like I am using or you use a video, etcetera. Now, visual aids are useful, but do not overdo the use of visual aids. Many people in one hour will try to put in 50, 60, 100 slides. And then what they are really doing is all the time clicking fast and going from one to the next. The audience in front or whichever is listening hardly gets time to read that power uh, that slide before you move on to the next slide. So, it is important not to have too many slides and to keep the information on each slide such that in about a minute you can read that. You do not put something very complicated lots of sentences, never do that for a slide. Always keep it simple with something effective that you want to say and it is useful to keep that in mind. As I said, I have seen hundreds of presentations in which people come with 50 slides and they get 20 minutes and all they are doing is going from one slide to the next and the audience cannot quickly grasp what is even in one slide before they go to the next. Then nothing is obtained because the audience does not gain from that presentation. And of course, delivering the talk is important, how you begin is important. Uh, the verbal delivery you make, the use of short and simple sentences is important, uh, the place where you sit or stand is important. You will be amazed how many lectures I have attended, where the speaker is between you and the slides, so that you cannot see the slide. To see the slide, you have to look this way or that way. And the speaker, if he had stood on the side, would probably not have come in anybody's way, but it happens unknowingly. So, it is important to position yourself so that this, the audience can see the slides quite easily. Now, you will say, well, this is trivial, everybody knows it, but yet 
it is something that happens all the time, you see people making this error. So, positioning yourself well uh, is also an important part of making a good presentation. And as I said, these are a few points, I am not trying to cover everything. Yeah. The last issue which I think is important, which I think needs to be covered and that is the issue of plagiarism. Plagiarism is defined as follows and I put down a not a definition really I put it in my own words. It says using someone else's research work in the form of ideas, results or words and passing it off as one's own work by not giving credit to the original work. This is called plagiarism. Plagiarism with goes without saying is unethical, it is incorrect, but it is widespread. Let us let us understand that and it is not something to be encouraged. So, it is important particularly in PhD work in research work to bring to the attention of every research worker that whatever you do keep in mind that if it is someone else's work give credit to that person for the work. Do not say it is mine, do not show some result of yours as mine. Now, Many people do not understand the importance and then once in a while you will see if you look at newspapers, somebody gets caught and there is a big scandal over it and things like that. It happens all the time in international journals. Of course, plagiarism itself is of two types. One is the type I mentioned here, uh, uh, you know, you uh, ideas, results of people are picked up. But sometimes words are picked up and a sentence or two from one paper appears in another and particularly if it appears in the introduction, it is not that serious, but people make a big issue of that. They will, if somebody writes 20 words which has been picked up from another paper, even if it is in the introduction, a big issue is made that you know he has copied me and so on and newspapers love that because it is news, you know, news has to be created nowadays. So, uh, whichever it is, the fact is it is not to be encouraged and there are ways on uh, even when it comes to words that one has software which can tell whether one has copied even by uh, chance somebody else's words. So, one can detect those and see that that does not happen even if even if when it is unintentional. But I thought I should mention this because as I said there are many people who do not appreciate this fact and it needs to be reiterated that it is something which we need to always see does not occur when doing research work for a thesis. So, now let me conclude. What have I said? I have given you a whole process for doing a PhD and I have said it is not the Bible. It is not something 1, 2, 3, 4 and this is it. I am saying this is an indicative process with feedback. It gives you an idea how to proceed in scientific or technical investigations. But I did not say one thing and I said enjoy your research while doing your PhD. To be quite honest with you, if somebody today were to tell me what period of your life would you like to go back to? I would say the period when I was doing my research for my PhD. At that time, I did not realize how, 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 how much I was enjoying it. It took me 10 years and 15 years later to see how much I enjoyed doing research when I did it. So, if you can, do try to always see research is an enjoyable experience doing it for your PhD, identifying a problem, planning a problem. It is time consuming, it tries your patience. If you are married, it tries your wife's patience or she it is a woman and tries her husband's patience, true, but it is still an enjoyable experience. Look upon it as something in which you are journeying, learning something, treating it as a challenge and then it becomes also an enjoyable experience. If you can do that, the chances are you will do a PhD even better than you would otherwise have done. And uh, let me sum up by saying it is uh, again as I said at the beginning, a great pleasure to be here this morning to start this workshop by giving this general lecture or doing research for a PhD. What I have done is, I have identified a process, a procedure for doing a PhD. I have talked about the importance of communicating well both in writing and speaking. I have talked briefly about the fact that since it is a long drawn out process, you need perseverance, you need motivation and if possible enjoy it. There is no reason why you cannot when you are young. And I briefly touched on the issue of plagiarism because I think it is important in today's world that we do things ethically correctly because that also sets an example to our students with whom we are dealing from day to day. So, I thank you again for listening to me. 
patiently I hope wherever you are and uh, I think there is a little time left and I would be glad to handle questions if there are any uh, uh, as we go along. VGTI Mumbai go ahead. What is the ba backing of a benchmark journal that one can have for sir? If I want to have my work being, being benchmarked by a referred journal sir, so how do you identify such referred journals that are there? Classification of such referred journals in the world sir. Maybe any area. Let it be chemical engineering, let it be electrical engineering, sir. What you are saying is, after the work is done, you need to publish it. Now, does one look ahead and say, well, it has to go into that journal and then only will it make an impact? I, I think that is not the way to approach it. The way to approach is, you do research of a certain quality because you have done a careful literature search. Therefore, automatically there is a certain quality built into the research that you are doing. Now, once you have reached and got results of that quality, you will automatically look for a journal which has that impact factor in which that particular topic tends to be published. That is how we go. So, one does not in advance say before beginning that I am going to publish in this. What one says is, I am going to do quality work. As it goes along, I will decide which journal to go to depending upon that area that which on which specifically I have worked. Okay. That is the way yeah. to proceed. Thank you very much sir. Thank yeah. you sir. This is from Srinagar who has a question. Sir, I am in the agriculture sciences. I am doing my doctorate program. Yeah. In? Okay. Now my question is that whenever we have a result because we are doing the secondary research. We are not doing the primary research. We are doing the secondary research. Okay. So whenever we have a result, we have to go to the reference. Then we have to find out a reference that is in line with my result. So don't we think that we are giving the scope to modify our result because if, if I find that my result is not in line with the other findings, then that was the scope to, for me to modify it because no one else is uh, saying that result. It is only... Yeah. I have got what you are saying. Now what... My uh, as I understand it, you are saying we are working in an area in which there are already some results. We have got some more results which are not quite agreeing with what has been presented. So, you would like to present them, fine. So, the originality of your work lies in saying, although I worked in an area in which others are working, I have results which are somewhat different. So, by all means go ahead and present those results. Make sure you give reference <laughs> to the other results by giving the, that uh, reference saying so and so has said this, these are my results, we are disagreeing with each other here, we may be agreeing somewhere else, whatever it is, perfectly all right. So, the originality of your work lies in the fact that you are doing something which you say others have done, yet for some part of it you are not agreeing with the results of somebody else, that is quite all right. Nothing wrong with that. Actually, sir, the, I want to know that uh, do we need, uh, is, is it not the high time to revise our PhD format? Because in our PhD format, we have to give our reference in line with what others have found out. We no, cannot no. have a, re, we cannot quote our result which others have said, uh, which others have got the positive result. That so, is this is what our uh, uh, agriculture uh, post uh, the doctorate program is like. We no, I, I do not agree with that. You do not have to agree with what others have done. So long as whatever you are saying is correct, that means your results have been obtained correctly and you are confident about them, well you represent them saying this is what I have got. You can disagree with somebody, certainly if your results are different. But make sure you can stand up to the uh, whoever scrutinizes your work and finds that there are no faults in it. Okay? So, I do not see anything wrong with presenting results which are in conflict with somebody else's so long as you are confident of what you are doing, absolutely nothing wrong. Yeah, NMIT Bangalore, please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, sir. So, as you mentioned, uh, as you mentioned, in every thesis, there is a literature review as a second chapter. And uh, in literature review, uh, most of the time, uh, when the survey is done and we have collected the material, we try to repeat those things which have been done by the people and that is how it gives a new idea for us to go to the research methodology which have been left out in a particular problem which has been defined. Now, this literature review which we are mentioning in our thesis, does it come under plagiarism or how much percentage is allowable 
to be produced or reproduced of a original work of some person which has been done. The literature review is not plagiarism if you give credit to all those authors. That means you say so and so has done this and then you reproduce even a figure from that person's thesis or paper, no problem. The important thing is to give credit to the person who has done the work, then it is not plagiarism. If however, you quote something and say this has been done and you do not give a reference to the author who has done it, then that is plagiarism because it appears as if you might have done it. So, plagiarism means using or mentioning somebody else's work, but not giving credit by referring to that work of that author. So, there is no plagiarism involved if you give credit and refer to the particular author who has done it. You can even reproduce a whole figure of somebody else's, but in the title of that figure say from so and so and give that reference. SVP college, go ahead with your question if you have one. Uh, so, this is uh, uh, regarding the sixth point that is about the deliver delivering a seminar talk. Actually, what I want to know is at what level, like uh, in the beginning before starting the uh, research work of a thesis or before just uh, submission of thesis, sir? One, I said during my presentation, can you hear me? I said during my presentation that it is good if you can deliver one seminar roughly around step number 5 or 6 when you have defined your research problem after doing the literature review. That means, about an year or so after you have begun your research, you are ready with what you want to do, that is a good time to present a seminar, so that you have defined your problem and so you tell what you want to do in front of a certain audience, which includes your guide and some other professors and so on. And then of course, at the end, it is always a requirement when the thesis reports come in that one makes a presentation. So, this is the bare minimum. But some universities require also an annual presentation. The more presentations you make, the better you will be able to appreciate what you are doing. But certainly, one at the time that you have roughly defined your problem and one at the end are minimum that one should be doing, are the minimum number that one should be doing. Goa College. Good, af good afternoon, sir. My question is, uh, uh, how much weightage do we have for statistical research methodologies for PhD work, for statistics? If I want to do any uh, research work uh, based on some statistics of some area, how much weightage do we have? And normally when we do literature survey, uh, how, on an average, how much time uh, should we spend for literature survey, good literature survey, on an average? There are two separate questions you have asked. One is, how much time should you take over a literature survey? That I mentioned during my talk, if you are a full time student for your PhD, your uh, literature survey should lead to a definition of your research problem reasonably accurately and it usually takes up to one year to do that. That means, you have collected, collected all the relevant literature, done all the background reading, all the general reading, some coursework may be involved and at the end of it, you are ready to say what you precisely want to do. It can take up to one year for a full time student. That was one question. The second question which you had, which you asked first was, what is the use of statistics for planning your research? Am I right? No, if my research is based on some statistics. Okay, okay. Some statistical kind of research, okay. for example, something in data mining or information retrieval, something based on statistics, how much weightage do we have in for such work? There is no such thing as weightage in a PhD thesis, you see, there is no such thing as a weightage. It Finally, it comes to this, whatever you are doing with those statistics in that work that you are doing, whatever you are doing, interpretation of those statistics or, you know, uh, in some way, dealing with that statistics, is that work original? Is that a contribution to the subject in which you are working? That is the issue. There is no question of saying how much weightage do I give to this, it is not a test or a quiz, you understand. Is there an originality in what you are doing? Is it leading to new knowledge in the subject? That is the question we have to ask always. NITK Suratkal, go ahead with your question. Uh, in, your in your lecture, you said the research process would vary from engineering and sciences 
and other disciplines to what extent it would vary sir suppose if one were to do research in say management do you say the research process steps which you have said would vary significantly or would be almost the same well uh, uh, let me take up your issue is for a management degree would the research process be different uh, probably yes because the management process very often a degree a doctoral degree in management doesn't call for experimental work of the type we do in engineering and science it doesn't also call for the type of analytical work or numerical work that we do in engineering involving equations solving equations and so on so in that sense it's different it involves very often getting data on surveys of various kind it involves very often trying to see certain topics and case studies and trying to see results of case studies and so on so the results i mean the research process may therefore have to be adapted keeping that in mind that's what i meant because the nature of the work done is different compared to what i was describing now what it will be specifically in management again i cannot say that it would be this but it would probably be different because the nature of the work that you are presenting or dealing with in doctoral programs in management are usually different compared to what i was describing